But coming up next is a new independent film called The Big Diss. Stay with us. Why is she so bad to you? Does she have other boyfriends? No, but she doesn't take my feelings into consideration. Oh, that's too bad. That's really too bad. So you should, like, find another girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing. By getting the girlfriend. Excuse me. Um, I'm kind of sleepy. So I think I'm going to go upstairs. Okay. The Big Diss is being held as a breakthrough film, applauded for its matter-of-fact approach to interracial portrayals, and is the first feature film effort of director Gordon Erickson and producer Heather Johnston. Welcome to Inner City Beat. Thank you. Good to be here, Scott. We might want to point out right off the top that both of you are Harvard graduates. And with, with that being said, there are a lot of filmmakers coming out of Harvard. Is it the new kid on the block as far as independent filmmakers? A lot of the bigger traditional film schools like NYU and UCLA and USC, uh, you're, you're one person among hundreds. So the industry gets used to seeing a lot of people with those degrees. However, uh, Harvard is a very interesting little film program and it has a different kind of cachet. So Why is it interesting? Well, it's not really, uh, they don't teach you to make little audition films. Um, you don't make little 10-minute uh, dramatic films that are meant to catch the eye of a, a Hollywood producer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more documentary oriented. It, it teaches you how to make personal films that emphasize real people and much so more. And it raises social consciousness possibly? Uh, I, I th well, certainly more than NYU or USC, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, much more of an academic approach to, to filmmaking as opposed, I, perhaps I think the other schools tend to be more of a look at it in a business way, a, perhaps a viable commercial way, not to say that it's not an artistic, those aren't artistic schools, right. but I just think that Harvard doesn't have that in mind in their film department and as much. As a result, I mean, the, the films that get made in that program maybe stick out a little bit more. Now, in the big disc, you decided not to use a script, or you used an outline of a script we, and improvised. Why did you decide to do it that way? Well, it, it, it came out of two things. I mean, we actually did have a script that uh, we had written and we had this group of friends and some of who had done a little bit of acting. Heather and I are also in the film, actually. And um, we discovered that people are a lot more at ease making up their own dialogue and just sticking to the kind of storyline that we mapped out for them. Secondly, um, just the idea of throwing away the script came because um, again, this Harvard documentary tradition that uh, teaches you to make these documentaries about real people and mm -hmm. let them speak for themselves. Uh, I, I had made a, a, a documentary the year before that Heather did some work on that was about a 14-year-old and adolescence, I guess. Mm -hmm. So when you decided to make it, I mean, it takes place in Long Island, uh, both of you from Long Island, and it as everybody acclaims it as this great melting pot film. Was that your intention in the beginning or is that the way it is? Um, I guess it's, we used those who were available and that it came out that everyone was noticing that it was so interracial. I, I mean, that's an obvious thing, but I guess it was so obvious that we didn't even really mm. see it uh -huh. when, you know, literally people who were in the movie were the ones who were available at the time. <laughs> it could have been with a few exceptions, some were particularly chosen, but there are a lot of, a lot of the variations of cultures just came because I guess that's something of that's a reflection, of right, of our neighborhood. circle of friends and a little bit of the neighborhood. Um, there are a lot of different. Do cultures you have a problem when critics do make a point of that? Um, not really. I mean, I, I th critics are wrong when they write that. Uh, some people have seen it as being intentional. It wasn't intentional. We didn't set out to say we want to make uh, a self-consciously interracial film. We just said we want to make a film in the neighborhood that we grew up in and happened that we had grown up in an interracial neighborhood and had an interracial circle of friends. But uh, no, I'm, I'm happy when critics approve of that or say this is that they like to see that, that this is a little seen uh, bit of American culture because it is. Hollywood, Hollywood doesn't know how to, uh, it, you either have a black film or a, a quote-unquote mainstream film, which means a white film. Mm -hmm. Occasionally Hollywood will 
take a part that uh, was written for a white character and put a black actor or actress in that part to kind of integrate the film as, in a token way. But solely but, for that reason is what they're doing. But solely for that reason. It's a conscious and, effort. And, and they kind of ignore race. I mean, they just don't want to deal with it at all. Now, when you were taking the film around, you went to different festivals, mm -hmm. and you even had seminars afterwards. Uh, there's an incident in Toronto that you talked about. Tell me more about that. <laughs> um, I, I don't um, know how to describe it. That was one of the only times uh, in a question and answer situation after a screening, but there was someone who was um, really resentful of uh, the interracial milieu. They thought it um, that the black characters were representing all of black people and the white characters are representing all of white America and they didn't like what that the film was therefore saying. Mm -hmm. And um, the ironic thing in all of that was that once the people realized that um, the film came from improvisation and it had an uh, interracial producing staff, creatively producing staff, they backed off. So they said that prior to you know, prior to them knowing that it was an interracial exactly. crew. Exactly. Okay. They, they were most upset about this white director and, you know, oh my gosh, these white directors are talking about black America. And then they saw I was involved and they realized that the lead character had an enormous amount of input. And somehow it went from being, you know, a critical look from an outside perspective to sort of a relaxed to an insider's, insider's view, which I, I sort of have a little problem with because I think if something is wrong, then it's wrong mm -hmm. generally. And if some, I mean, if it offends you, I don't see why it shouldn't offend you if it's coming from me as opposed to him. But but that's the way it happened. That's how it. Now that's Matt Dillon also stood up for you yeah. guys. Oh, that's right. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I could describe that. Go ahead, please. Uh, I, I mean, the film played the Toronto Film Festival, and um, sometimes, well, actually, this is the only time it ever happened at a film festival. Some uh, white audiences love this film for some reason. They, and sometimes they mistake it as being a. Uh, as having the message that, well, that, that look, but just because this is a happily integrated film, race is not a big issue anymore, and that isn't everything wonderful, it's not a problem. And um, I, I think that, that kind of uh, reaction in the film by white audiences makes, uh, in a very white city like Toronto, where there were, there were really just one or two black audience members, I think that made them feel very defensive. And, uh, um, one of the black audience members thought that, oh, the, the, you know, they didn't like the politics of it. They thought that's what it was saying. Right. And Matt Dillon, who was there supporting a Drugstore, drugstore cowboy. cowboy, got up in the audience and had like an, a big argument with the guy saying, you just don't get it. It's about a guy trying to get abroad, <laughs> you know, on a weekend <laughs> pass. What's York the big film. deal? And then actually Matt was kind of arguing the, the wrong politics <laughs> and we were trapped in the middle I mean but he was really nice. but he appreciated the he film nice. nonetheless and I liked that he liked the film but I, I'm not sure what he thought it was saying really was what it was saying now we have another clip um, if you could set it up and then we'll take a look at it sure um, this is the towards the end of the film and absolutely everything that could go wrong for JD probably has gone wrong he's been dissed and dismissed by just about every woman except his mother which is about to you know, what will happen. <laughs> we'll, we'll take a look at that clip right now. Here's a look at it. It's 5 a.m. Do you know where your children are? I know where my children are. You're sitting out here shooting the breeze at 5 o'clock in the morning, and you haven't even packed. Damn. Do you know what time your flight leaves? You're supposed to leave here in half an hour if you hope to make that flight. OK? Otherwise, uh -huh. you're going to have to sprout your own wings. What do you have to talk about at this hour in the morning? Okay, you don't have to answer. You don't have to answer. Just get with it. Come on, get moving now. Otherwise, you're really going to have to fly back. All right. Come on. All right. Okay, so now what happens with independent filmmakers? You've made this film. You've taken it to the festivals. You found a distributor. What's the next step for you guys? To make <sighs> another film. Yeah. That's the most important thing for any filmmaker. Is to move on to the next project and yeah. not get stuck dragging the same film around year after year. Really. <laughs> well, we, we're still in debt from the big disc, but uh, 
I mean, because it played all these American film festivals, eventually somebody, a few people in Hollywood saw us and have offered us budgets. Uh, we're right now writing a script for HBO, and there are one or two others that uh, we have in development, but we don't have the complete budget yet. Would you encourage other people to make independent films after two years of taking your own film on I, the road? I, 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 I mean, maybe it'd be easier I'd if... I'd warn them. <laughs> I, I, yeah, if, um, if somebody did want to make independent films, I'd warn them that you, you either win or die, that you can never quit, and if you... If, you're, if there's any point at which you'll give up, where if you're not willing to, you know, mortgage your mother's house, then you shouldn't do it because that's what it takes. You just can't. But I think it's very important for people who have something to say and it's something that's sort of outside the mainstream of Hollywood funding, then they should do what they can do to get it said. Which because a lot of that's what makes, um, you know, it's a reflection of the United States and that's what's important about American film. And that's what the, a lot heard. of the independent filmmakers are now doing, Absolutely. such as Townsend and Lee. Well, I, I mean, I think, this, I think the latest wave of uh, independent filmmakers, I mean, they're going to be the Hollywood establishment in 20 years. And, and if people like this weren't coming up, then there'd be nothing left for Hollywood to say. I mean, they're, they're, they're sort of out of, they're, they're out of ideas. And really, wouldn't, the industry wouldn't exist if it weren't for outsiders. Gordon Erickson and Heather Johnston, makers of The Big Disc, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. The Big Disc is now heading for theaters in Chicago, Atlanta, and Detroit.